if I'm performing at 100%, I always believe that, you know, being in the middle of the pitch, I can have a huge effect on whether we win or lose the game. Your girlfriend and your dogs, they don't see you because you're in a spare room <laughs> with drone footage and different <laughs> sheets that you've been given trying to, to better yourself. You are laughing, but... Is that what you do? I do that for a bit, yeah. You can do like a swan. You can do... I'm, no, no, oh. I'm, you can, but I'm not at that level yet. You can do a love art. I can Is do that... like... A love art's like stage one. I was going to say, I'm I at like probably stage could do that. two. Today's guest is one of our own who joined the club age eight before driving up and down the country on loan before coming back here and making his first team debut in 2018. And he's been a mainstay at the club ever since. And earlier this year, he also surpassed the landmark of 150 appearances for the club. He wears the number 22 and was a pivotal part in the promotion winning side of last season. Apparently, he also dabbles in a bit of latte art. We'll ask him about that in a short while because I have no idea research. what that's about. <laughs> he, of course, is also our vice captain. Please welcome to the official Nottingham Forest podcast on and off the pitch, Ryan Yates. Did you like my latte art to knowledge? How do you know that? That's oh, the question. I have my sources. I know, because you don't share much on Instagram, which makes my research pretty tough. Because mm. usually the first thing is Twitter and then Instagram. And you don't yeah, share much. Why? Much. Um, I think when I was a bit younger, I used to put a few things out there. But I think just gaining a bit more of a following. I just like to be quite private. And my family's quite private. And... Yeah, just let my, my talk in on the pitch. Just makes my job really hard. So thank you very much for that. So I have to ask around for uh, to know a bit more about you. But um, it's, it's always great being a forest for myself, actually getting to sit down with you guys as well and try and learn more about you. I actually said to Ryan before we sat down, please just tell me loads of stories because we as fans just want to get to know you a little bit better today. So that's what it's about. And thanks for coming when it's been a snowstorm outside. It was absolutely horrific today. What was training like this morning? <laughs> It was tough, but, you know, we got through it. Sometimes it's it's quite good, you know, when, when something different like this happens, when the weather's a bit mad, because you can just have a bit more of a laugh. Um, you just can't take it as seriously, you know, people are chucking snowballs in the warm-up and stuff. Um, but we've got some good work done and, and everyone's OK. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it and I'm glad to be here. Did anyone make a snowman? Was there enough snow for that? Nah, there was not enough time. It'd get kicked over anyway by someone and are um, you allowed to wear gloves or is that something in the group no you know we're, we're gonna be hard we're not allowed to wear gloves no we? no I've, yeah we were, we were wearing gloves literally there was barely any skin showing to be honest um especially when we were doing the tactical bits um yeah stood around it was it was quite chilly well thanks then for coming up here because it's cold in this little uh, box as well so if we go blue guys sorry it's blooming freezing anyway ryan let's start um last year because it was a pretty good year you've been here like I just mentioned since you were eight years old uh, it's been a long journey for you mm. and one which I don't know if you expected it to come around in the year it came around you getting promoted to the Premier League after 23 years out 1999 I don't even know how old you were when you were last in the Premier League how old were you maybe one two one or two yeah <laughs> you can't even remember it um absolutely not what on earth was last year like let's give a summary first before I go okay deep dive into okay. it okay where do I start? Okay, obviously, I think every season at, at Forest, there's always a big expectation, um, you know, to be minimum in and around the playoffs. <clears throat> and, you know, with the with the financial investment that the owner's putting in, um, you know, that, that is the minimum requirement. And, you know, I remember first game of the season with Hewton as manager, um, I got given the armband. Um, I think Worrell was injured. Remember, I barely slept that night. Honestly, and usually I'm, I sleep really well before games. Um, just remember, I was so nervous. Thinking, God, first game of the season, Coventry away, got off to a great start, and then uh, obviously ended up losing the game last minute. Um, basically, summed up the start of our season, playing okay, but just, just literally just not getting the results. Kept losing, kept losing. I can't remember exactly how many points we had when Cooper came in. Maybe one, but I knew we were bottom of the league. Um, Came in, just got us all together and just basically told us we were all great players and we need to believe in ourselves more, um, especially myself. Um, he spoke to me a few times um, about what, how much potential I could have, how much of an impact I could have on the team and I'm sort of holding myself back from, from reaching that and he's going to help me to, to eventually reach that but we just need to take it 
day by day, game by game. Obviously went on an, in- an incredible run, some ups and downs for myself and the team. Um, and Obviously that's that special day at Wembley. You said that when Steve Cooper came in, he said that all of you guys, the squad, needed to believe in yourself. Surely there is a professional footballer you already have that belief and someone like you as well who from what I know of you kind of always looks internally and tries to better yourself were you lacking that at that point would you say oh yeah de- definitely I think you know I'm I'm still on a journey you know of, and I'm trying to improve different aspects of my game now in the Premier League but I think at, at that time I I probably put on a strong face and you know I wanted to play every game and, and I was confident but you know that I think your your self-belief is you know there's never a limit to that and what I thought was good was obviously no way near the level it, it could be and, and, and can still improve for sure. And I think that's the main thing when, you know, Steve Cooper came through the door is that he put his arm around a few people and, and, and told us how much he believed in us. And, and then we went and, you know, with a few tactical things, which he, um, he works on every day with his staff. Um, we just progressively day by day, like I say, we never, we never looked further than, than the next game. And, and I think that's, that's the same in the Premier League. We're not, we're not looking about, you know, um, three games down the line. We're literally looking at the next game and, and how we can improve. In terms of then, he had obviously conversations with you as a collective and then individuals. Did he change the environment? Did he put in any kind of Steve Cooper traits or things that you hadn't really seen another manager do before? And especially Houghton, who obviously left when Steve came in. Was there anything in particular that you kind of went, oh, this is interesting, I haven't quite seen this in managers gone by? Probably the main thing for me that sticks out is that he he bought in an, an incredible backroom team. You know, the detail we were going into off the training pitch in the, in the analyst suites with, the, with his head analyst and, and all his guys, the data we were looking at was something that I'd sort of, you know, poked my toes into, but not not completely, you know, thought about it. And I think it just gave me another outlook on on the game and how much detail they were putting into each and every game. And and that definitely one thing that you know every every opposition is different, and we'd train differently in the week to prepare us for a different opposition um, instead of just going into the game and, and sort of hoping, you know, what what we do is good. We were really focusing on on every game as an individual. Did you take homework? away as well I seem like you're the kind of person that would do homework um, away from the training ground as well yeah not uh, you could sort of say homework but I, I do look at my at my game at my training you know now we've got like drones that float above um, us whilst we train and it gives us another view of of where we can look back and you know the analysts will give us our, our clips or the or our training um, that we can analyze so yeah it really is in depth and it's something I, I really enjoy and I get a lot of um, uh, like good feedback from so I'm really looking forward to like improving that and, and continuing. So when you go home then, your girlfriend and your dogs, they don't see you because you're in the spare room <laughs> with drone footage and different <laughs> sheets that you've been given trying to, to better yourself. You are laughing, but... I, Is that what you do? I, I do that you? for a bit, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I do because, you know, I want to... Sorry, I want to um, continue to improve my game. And I think, you know, look, looking back in training, training such a such a vital part of, of improvement... You know, for me, I've always been one that, you know, you train how you play and, you know, if you can look back at things in training when, you know, and it's really intense and in depth, you know, there's, I'm not one to just go in and train and then go home and forget about it. I like to think about what I've done right and, and you know, how I can affect the team and improve. You also mentioned that there was this kind of, I guess, every season when it starts, playoffs used to be the goal in mind. Mm. Was that something that actually was said out loud or was it just something that you felt was always the target? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it might have been said, but I think, like like you say, it was just that internal. You know, this is Nottingham Forest. This is a massive club. We we need to be fine at the right end of the table. And you know, when the owner's putting in, you know, the investments he is, it's it, it speaks for itself. So I think there's always that expectation from the supporters, from from you know people upstairs. So, um, which is is something I'd probably say we didn't embrace until Steve Cooper came to the club. Um, I think he was the first manager who really, really got the fans on side. And you know how incredible the fans are here when you, when you can use them to your advantage. It is literally like having the 12th man, as you can see from, from many of the home games this season. When he came in, what did you think the end of the season would look like? Genuinely, where did you think you guys would finish? Um, Considering where you were when he came in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be totally honest. Like When um, Steve Cooper came in, 
I just I didn't I just thought wow this manager can really improve me as a player and I, I didn't even I honestly did not even think I didn't want I didn't want to think about the end of the season because we were bottom of the league firstly but I was just more excited to see where I could improve as a player and I'm thinking wow is the things he was saying you know the positions he wanted me to be in in the pitch are really going to suit me and knowing that with him and his you know his background staff how much improvement I can make in such a short time is going to be really exciting. When did you guys then believe that the Premier League was a real possibility? I, I would probably say... Because um, as a fan, you're kind of never quite sure here. Yeah, and you know what? I'm not, I'm not surprised the fans were like that because, you know, <laughs> I've came out, you know, so many times with, with um, my dad and, and my brother watching throughout the years and, you know, it's like, oh, same old Forest, you know, do really well and then suddenly drop off, don't make the playoffs and, uh, you know... Um, it was like that for so many years um, but I think like going back to your question I think there was some massive moments in the season them sort of season defining games where you don't get beat or um, you know you pick up a massive win I think a few that stick in my mind is sort of the Bristol City away where Lyle Taylor scored two in the last minute I think I'm not just saying it because I scored but the, the Sheffield United we were sort of I think we might have been seventh and they were sixth with a bit of a gap um, and we scored last minute, one all, so we kept within touching distance. Um, you're thinking, wow, we, we we could get in the playoffs here. Um, and then sort of our mindsets um, changed. We had a few games, we beat Reading 4 0 here. We kept winning, kept winning, kept winning, and we thought, wow, we, like forget the playoffs. You know, let's let's continue, and we're gonna get we're gonna get second. Um, so, you know, I think. Sort of after a, we beat Swansea five one um, here at the City Ground, Sam Surrey scored a hat trick. Um, he was in incredible form. Keenan Davis was out injured, and we're thinking, wow, what what a powerful team! We've got goals all over the pitch. Let's just push Bournemouth as far as we can. And then obviously we had that game where we didn't perform, um, but we were fully confident going into the playoffs that you know if we beat Sheffield United, then then definitely we're favourites. Tell me about the two legs then. Over Sheffield United. I mean, watching that was hard enough. Mm. How is that of playing it and being in those moments and having to go down as it mm. did to penalties? I mean, I yeah, yeah. It Take was, us through that journey. Yeah, it was. Um, it's. I always say it's a little bit strange because it's it's two legs. So we were obviously at, we thought we were at a bit of an advantage because we had the second game at the City Ground. Obviously at their place, Brennan was on fire. We we started so well, um, had a great advantage. Um, am I right in saying it was two 0 and they scored last last minute to make it two one? In the first leg. In the first yeah. leg, yeah. Jack Robinson scored. <laughs> um, I just remember feeling oh, we could have done with a two goal advantage. Um, that they, they've sort of got a bit of hope now um, coming back to the city ground. But we thought, you know what, we, we've got a lead. Let's just, you know, let's not sit back. Let's go for the, the second, the third goal at the City Ground. I remember it was quite an anxious evening. Um, I felt really calm, to be honest. What was it like before that? Kind of, what does a a vital game mm. vibe look like in the dressing room before you go out there? Does, does Steve say anything different to you than he usually does? Um, mm. What does that look like? I think one of the great things with the manager is he'll, he'll never change from his approach whether it's a playoff final or a, a huge game or, you know, <laughs> like a pre-season friendly out in Greece, you know, before the Premier League kicked off again. I think he's just exactly the same. He says, stick to the plan, enjoy what you do and, and go and express yourself. Um, and that was exactly the same. Um, we knew we had to attack the game from the off. Obviously, Brennan scored an unbelievable goal. Um, but that's football, isn't it? And it's it's sort of it was sort of like that moment of like our oh, typical Forest ended up giving it away almost at the end. Bree Samba, incredible keppers in it, and then obviously the penalties speak for itself. But I've never been more nervous watching them penalties. I, I, honestly, it'd have been so hard watching it as a fan. But I think once once we got over that that game and we got through, however we did, we always knew if if we performed well at Wembley, then then we'd be in the Premier League. Then Wembley happened. You make a trip to Wembley. Mm. For a Forest player, what is it like to play at Wembley? Somewhere you've been dreaming of getting mm. for years now. 
You get there in the most expensive game in football, everything's on the line. Is it that kind of mentality of this is it? What on earth happens if we don't quite make it? What's that kind of bus journey down to the capital mm. like for the team? Um, I just said to myself, so when I was on loan, I, I played in uh, the League One playoffs and we unfortunately didn't get to Wembley. And I remember I was, I was being, I was sort of thinking about being nervous for Wembley even before the semi-final and we ended up not getting there um, in the end. But I just said to myself, whatever happens, if I ever, you know, my cushion's gone. If I ever do get back to um, in this same position, just do not worry about it. Just go and play your game because you're not going to perform at your best if you if you think about the consequences. Is that what you've learned, again, since maturing? Has mm. someone, um, I guess, instilled that in you? Have you worked on your mental kind of side of the game? Yeah, yeah, I, d I definitely have worked on that side of the game. But I think just having the, the experience and, and having the games, you realise like a lot of things are out of your control. One of my favourite sayings is sort of control the controllables. Um, I can only affect my performance. Um, if I'm at, if I'm performing at one hundred percent, I always believe that you know being in the middle of the pitch, I can have a huge effect on whether we win or lose the game. So I was just making sure my preparation was was really good, and you know I do a lot of like. Um, you know, power poses and making sure my, you know, I'm giving off really good vibes to the to the rest of the players, and and I just wanted to be really present during the whole thing, um, win, lose or draw. But I knew that, you know, if if I could be present and be in the moment, that, you know, that would give me the best chance to influence influence the team and get us the win. Power pose is that just kind of how you, I guess, hold yourself? Mm. I'm a former athlete, and actually that's interesting because my mum always used to say to me I looked really nervous and there was mm. this one girl that was always a rival I remember like at all the national champs she used to look so arrogant I'm not gonna name her she probably know who she is <laughs> and I was always like oh I wish I looked like that mum was like you can do I would I actually was all right I used to win quite a lot of races I was an 800 meter runner but uh I would have loved to have known that is that something again that you've kind of tried to teach some of the other players do you sometimes see some of the players looking nervous you're like if you just Pretend you're not nervous. Mm. It kind of works, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it is science. Yeah. Um, where I've learned that from, I'm not going to take the credit. Um, <laughs> it is my my cousin, my auntie. A lot of my family like always send me bits because they know I'm really interested in in improving my you know my mental health and and uh, the mental side of my game. So my cousin actually sent me that. She's trained to be a psychologist and no, no, really interesting. And I want to again continue to improve that side of the game for sure. So you're at Wembley, you're doing your power mm, pose, mm. you're trying to, I guess, make sure everyone else is, <laughs> is super confident as well. Um, it was an interesting game. Tell me about how you feel it unfolded on the it pitch. It was a very boring game. Uh, I didn't use that word. <laughs> no, but it, it's really difficult because there is a lot of a lot of anxiety, a lot of nervous, yeah. nervous energy. But I guess that's what a final of that magnitude is going to be mm. like, right? Yeah, well, yes, yes and no, because I've seen, you know when I watch the Champions League and some massive games. World Cup, for Yeah, example. exactly. Yeah. Sometimes they're, they're really exciting. And, you know, I, I always think if we'd have played Sheffield United that day, I think it would have been maybe finished 4-3 either way, maybe. So, no, we, it didn't really matter. We were just completely focused on ourselves. Um, whether they sat in a mid-low block like they did or if they came after us, what we were going to do, you know. So we were just like, whatever, whatever it takes today is it's going to be our day. Lifting the trophy on the balcony mm. at Wembley, where you've watched so many incredible teams do mm. that before, that was pretty special. Yeah, it was. It was a, incredible. It was actually funny because so obviously after a you know a few weeks after months, I'm like watching everything, blah, blah, blah. and then I thought right Premier League, boom, on to the next thing. Um, when we come back pre-season, that's all I'm thinking. Next step, next step, and then a few weeks back, I saw this 40 minute. Like uh, behind the scenes, Wembley Forest going up, and I just watched it, and I was like tearing up, and it's crazy. So I think just always keeping that in the back of your head, and how what an amazing moment it was, but always striving for for the next thing. I guess equally a great moment must have been when you're in Nottingham City Centre and just seeing mm. what it meant to the city, to the fans, because you could only obviously have a certain amount of fans mm. at Wembley, and watching that back. It just, again, shows what a big deal it is mm. and how much it means not just to you guys, it means so much to a community. Mm. Uh, yeah, honestly, that, that day, I didn't realise how many people were there. And we were just sort of in the, in the hall, having a laugh and stuff, and then 
uh, Colin was like, oh, Ryan, you're up first. Um, and I knew there'd be a lot of people. And I was like, yeah, no worries. I had like a little can of gin tonic. I was just put on the side. I went yeah, out. I went out. I, 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 yeah, I didn't. I didn't sleep much to be honest. I had a few drinks. That's fine. It was probably, You're a, it was probably a good thing to be honest because I was less nervous about speaking in front of so many people. Um, and then I've sort of walked up, walked up the steps, and I'm like, oh my god! Like I'm like my throat's like from my neck. Did, were um, you trying to point? pinpoint anyone in the crowd did you oh, your impossible. family there impossible, impossible. no uh, my mum and my brother and everyone were like right towards the back and then they got there pretty early so yeah um amazing that that is a special special moment that some of the pictures from that and and just you know ever i remember everyone at the front people were chucking them stuff and it was just like everyone was just it was like i've never known so many people in one area so happy just everyone was just smiling and it was just it was just an incredible incredible few hours do you think it has a, a greater impact on someone like you who's been there since you're eight and you know you get sung you're mm. one of our own people feel like they really know you and that maybe you kind of owe the club something as well because you are such a local lad yeah absolutely that's that's sort of how I felt you know I've been at the club I've had some you know, I had some tough moments when I was younger, tough moments going on loan, da, da, da. but, you know, the club has always stuck by me. And, you know, obviously I've committed a lot to the club, but I thought this is what the club deserve. And like I say, I don't I don't like to look back too much. And I just feel like this is where the club should be. We need to make sure now that this is where the club stays. Um, and, you know, we're on an incredible journey and I'm just, just really looking forward to, to what's next. I guess, how many people have you been able to share that with who have been here since you were eight? Are there still some staff members around the training ground and here at the city ground that you actually have known since that long? Are you kind of like the mm. mainstay here at the club? Not not many sort of people I'm with a day to day. I think I can think of a few kitchen staff like Jane, one of the one of the dinner ladies. We have an education officer called Dennis who pops in now and again. Um, but I. I Obviously, I didn't see him when I was eight, but th there isn't many. Obviously, Joe Worrell at the club, but I think he came when he was 10, 11. Uh, but I, that's very young, so there and, isn't many. And I guess when it had all kind of, you know, settled down, you'd had your summer break. I hope you had a nice summer break and was able to kind of switch mm. off from it a bit mm. before what happened here. Um, when you came back, had the changes already began and what were you really surprised that you'd already seen kind of changing to get ready for, for this new year in the Premier League? Yeah, they obviously, we, we came to the city ground to do, you know, photos to the new kit and everything and everything was getting changed, all the VAR and you could just see slow progress, investment in the changing rooms, training ground. Um, obviously all these things can't can't happen at once. They, you know, we were, you know, a year from then we were sort of bottom of the championship so they're not thinking about, you know, putting VAR in and they can't plan ahead. And as the manager said, this club is, is just moving in the right direction step by step but obviously... Things can't change in a night, and you know Rome wasn't built in a day, sort of thing. So you know, just keeping this club in the Premier League, you know, things will continue to improve. And I guess how difficult was it when the influx of players started to come in? I, you know, I know you've been asked that before, but obviously the side which got promoted so different to mm. it is now. And again, you're this player that's been here for so many years now. Did you feel a sense of responsibility to kind of? welcome everybody as they as they came through the doors and almost I don't know act as a a tour guide to the city mm. like how do you see that role uh yeah obviously at the start of the season getting the the vice captaincy I sort of did that anyway but I thought that it really is my responsibility to make everyone feel welcome um in the city and you know help where I can and I think just be just be someone someone can talk to obviously that is extremely difficult with you know signing players but you know like everyone says and we spoke about a lot, we, we needed to sign the players um, and like, you know, we, we've signed the right players with the right attitudes, which is great and, and just shows the ambition of the owners to be financially, you know, investing in the club like this. Were there any players in particular that kind of came to you as the local lad and was like, right, where do I go for lunch? Where do I go for a coffee shop? What do I do in town? I, I just say, speak to Joe Worrell because <laughs> he knows Nottingham better than me. Um, no, obviously I try and, I try and give my... My advice and, and things, but my taste is probably a bit a bit too healthy for some of the guys. So they're probably healthy. Like, uh, yeah, Go on, yeah. why why is it super healthy? I don't know. I just like to look after myself uh, a lot. So yeah, maybe. 
I know, it was, it was difficult, like I was saying, stalking you on Instagram. I was like, this guy's giving nothing away, but you did follow some lentil person. I was like, oh, okay, so he likes his kind of vegan... Oh, that, of- so that's my brother's girlfriend. Oh, yeah, yes. She, and- she's vegan and she does incredible recipes. I looked at her, web- her website and I was like, Started following her. I was like, "Love it." You'll probably think I'm now stalking him. By, by what? Obviously stalking him. Um, Lucy's lentils or something. Lucy and lentils. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So get on it, everyone. So please. do you cook kind of lentil recipes yourself? I actually don't know, <laughs> uh, uh, but Cuts but out but, the but we have a thing. So my girlfriend and my cousin uh, during COVID started a clothing brand called Wednesday Night Club. So so Wednesday Night Club as well on Instagram. And all my family, all the young younger side of the family, my cousin. Lucy, uh, my brother Lewis, um, we all get together and Lucy would cook um, something vegan. I might cook something or Emma or whoever. Um, and that was always on a Wednesday. So in the middle of the week, we'd have a get together. And then during COVID, they, they created this, this clothing brand. So what is Ryan Yates's uh, vegan recipe of choice if he was cooking dinner on a Wednesday? Okay, it would be a peanut butter curry. Oh. Chickpea. Peanut, pe- bu- peanut butter curry, yeah, yeah. If you love peanut butter, it's incredible. If you don't, obviously, it's horrendous. Have you tried it out with any of the boys yet? Uh, no. No. So we, no one can say if this is but good or not. You guys must know because you had this. Um, no, no, no. Listen, <laughs> you you had this on Facebook during COVID. You remember? Yeah. Was it awful, guys? I'm asking the no crew tri- behind no the cameras here. <laughs> we'll leave that out for the jury to decide. He'll have to cook this. Um, maybe international break. You can. Cook a curry and, and bring that, 100%, it. I do that, 100%. Yeah. Okay, I'm here every Thursday, so okay, cool. bring one in. Some latte art. <laughs> we'll get on to that. Now, latte art, go on, I mentioned it in the top. So, you've got a couple of hobbies mm-hmm. outside of football. I want to get back into the football mm-hmm. because we haven't really covered what I want yeah, to yet. Okay. Why? Is this a, a career in the future, a barista? What, what's the plan here with latte art? So, my brother got me into it. We just, you know, we got uh, a coffee machine, we learned to throth the milk properly. Uh, my brother went to a course. And you could do some patterns and stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then a few years later, I ended up buying a really nice machine. That was sort of my promotion present. I bought a La, La Mazzocco, uh machine. like Sounds really good, I- Italian, like really nice. I'm not into my cars or anything. Like I just like this machine. Good is, coffee. Yeah. Um, and then he taught me like how to get the milk spinning and yeah. So what's the greatest creation on the coffee? Uh, what's the greatest creation? I'd like to say you can do like a swan. You I'm, can do it. No, no, oh. I'm, you can, but I'm not at that level yet. You can do a love art. I can do Zap. like, a love art's like stage one. I was going to say, I'm I at like stage two okay, with well. like, um, like a, you, I, I know what you're going to say, those little like fir trees. Yeah, yeah, it's like a tree. Basically. It's a tree. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> I kind of bigged him up when I said yeah, he yeah, dabbles in latte good. art. He's up stage two, guys, and there's quite a lot of stages to go. <laughs> uh, you can... You know, Levant's do the printing coffee machines. I was at Wimbledon a couple of years ago and they printed a picture of my face on my coffee. Really? That's like stage 10. That's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that'd be impossible, I think. <laughs> well, anyway, that's something to work towards, isn't it? Sorry, that's, your... that's blown my mind a little bit. But... I'll, I'll show you a picture okay. in, in a bit. Um, right, let's go, let's go back mm. as well. I wanted to kind of go back to, you know, been here for years, we were talking about. Obviously, we were talking off camera about your loan spells as mm. well. And I kind of said, I felt. You'd stayed quite close to home. You go, no, it used to take me miles and hours to drive to Barrow. Go on then, talk me through the, the four-hour drives up to Barrow, which you said is not even in this country. Um, and what used to kind of... <laughs> Sorry, go, Barrow, love you. <laughs> what used to go through your head? And did you ever think you'd be here now at that point in your career? I did think I would get here. Uh, because you have this much yes, self-belief? Yes, definitely, yeah. And I feel like I can go even further. Um, but obviously back at my first loan at Barrow, I just remember I played, I just turned pro, I just got my pro contract, thought, oh my God, um, I'm a professional footballer at Nottingham Forest, and it's going to be amazing, I'm going to play at the city ground, played an under-23s game, the manager from Barrow in the conference was here watching, he thought, oh, we'll, we'll take him on loan, and I thought, yeah, I, I probably do need to play some games, for sure, um, and then a men's football um, I didn't have a clue where Barrow was, but I thought it can't be that far. Were you like me and thought it was Barrow upon <laughs> I just, I just thought, oh, they're not going to send me up there. No chance. Um, and then, so obviously, Barrow is like four hours away. Um, so we, a lot of the lads are based in Manchester and we trained in, in Oldham or something. So it's like two hours, a drive, and I'd stay overnight, go to Sainsbury's or Morrison something, get my couscous and some chicken and... Because I'm trying to still eat healthy and like do what Forrest have told me, and 
Um, a lot of the guys would go out for like a pizza or something. I'm like, no, I can't do that. Did you find that difficult then when they kind of had that lifestyle going on, mm. not to fall into that trap and, you know, possibly never then reach the potential that yeah. you wanted to? Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's got to be one of the hardest things for for young guys who go on loan because that is the mentality in the, in the lower leagues and especially sort of conference level below. You know, that they are just comfortable just making you know, making a living and, and just not living the best lifestyle. They're not they're not really pushing for, for the next level and, and they, they're not really maximising their full potential. And that's why I'm so lucky to have the family I have who always tell me, like, come on, you know, you, you can play for Forest, but you need to you need to dedicate, you need to sacrifice the, the small things. Did you need that encouragement? Did you need kind of those phone calls from your mum or dad mm. or your brother helping you at, at points throughout those four different loan spells mm. that you had? I, I don't think I, I did need their... I think I just needed them to be there for me. Um, just always a voice, but never... I think it was the inner belief, the inner drive that I knew what was right. The information we got from the academy was incredible. The work Gary Brazil, um, academy managers, does with the young guys is honestly incredible, the staff he has. So I had all the information, I just had to put it into practice. Um, but obviously it's very difficult when... The guys are going to Peaks Express and, you know, I'm sort of sitting there in the hotel room boiling the spinach and, yeah. And what kind of family dynamic do you have then? Because you've mentioned your family quite a lot here mm-hmm. and, you know, said it wouldn't be possible to be where you are now without them. What was it like growing up then in the Yates household? Mm. And, you know, how did that work ethic and that kind of mental strength which you show mm. and the willingness to just better yourself all the time is what mm. kind of I get from you how did that kind of come out and get instilled in yourself from an early age? You know, it's, it's a question I, I always ask myself a lot. Obviously, grew up in a family, mum, mum and dad, a really strong relationship with my, my brother, who's, who's good as gold, he never does anything wrong, was just the perfect big brother, really, because, you know, I was quite an energetic kid and, you know, he could have, you know, he could have, like, had a few fights with me because I was quite, quite naughty and he, and he didn't. So, obviously, a really, really healthy family, um, but I always think like why why did I have this and me and my brother have this real drive he's doing really well in his career like where did it come from because my dad is a joiner um, very comfortable with, with where he is but just loves his football um, and I think that's where the football side came he, he was so passionate about um, his team when we were growing up his uh, team being it was Man United yeah I thought yeah, you were going to say that yeah um, Forrest now come on Forrest now oh yeah, mass- yeah, he's, sure. yeah we're both totally um because I've been here for so long, um, and then my mum. I think I think I got the the inner drive because I can't think of anywhere else where I've got it. I think it must be from my mum. Um, I think she was super talented, but she always sort of held herself back. So Sporty or academic? She's just creative, okay. just super super creative, amazing. But she never really wanted to get outside her comfort zone. So when there was moments in my career where I thought, God, this is outside my comfort zone as like a 17, 18, 19 year old. You know, a lot of people would be like, oh, no. But my mum was always the one who pushed me to, you know, even if it doesn't work, just never have any regrets, just go for it. Because she, I think she has them regrets. So she wants to make sure that I fulfil my potential. Um, and I think that's where it comes from. Even now, she's like, you know, you need to get in the England team. This is, you know what I mean? Whereas a lot of people would say, oh, you're doing so well. But I think my mum and, and my brother are the ones like, no, you're better than that. You can continue to improve and... I've sort of then taken that on. And I guess your family now, how much of a, a part, you know, now you kind of don't maybe need their encouragement as mm. much because you're a grown man, but how much do they play a part of the Forest family? They've been here since mm. you were eight. Is this almost like their second home as well? <sighs> yeah, especially especially for my dad who's who did a lot of driving. Obviously, I was born in Lincoln and you know I'd have to come three, four, five times a week. Um, and, you know, he's trying to, you know, he had his, his own business and he was trying to, you know, with my mum, trying to, like, leave work early but still, you know, make enough money and um, I'm not saying we were skin or anything like that but, you know, it was a massive commitment for them driving from Lincoln, you know, sometimes an hour, hour and 15 each way. They saw that drive in me. My dad always said, you know, if it was such a big commitment that if he didn't see that I was enjoying it or I was really committed to to wanting to be a footballer, I think he'd have just said, oh, this is this is too much, Will. You know, you can go play for Lincoln because it's only 15 minutes away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I owe, obviously, everything to them. Um, 
And I feel like they've, they've really been on that journey with me. They still come and, and watch you as much as they can here, or mm. now that you're on TV more, they can probably sit at the comfort of their own home and, and just watch the cup of tea. Yeah, my mum um, my and my, my girlfriend likes, you know, if it's a big game on Sky, um, and I've got so many people asking for tickets, so I'll be like, well, you two don't mind just staying at home, so the rest of the family can come, you two can watch on the telly, which is useful, but now they were all here against Everton and, and I won't start in, so now my, my, especially my brother and my dad, they, they're so committed and they absolutely love it. And I was going to ask as well, kind of growing up, Obviously, being local, what did your school friends think when you signed for a club like Forest so young? Was it a bit like everyone wanted to be your friend? Or was there that kind of sense of jealousy, possibly, that this guy in my mm. class has achieved pretty much what every schoolboy in this country mm. wants to be a footballer? And girl now, especially after what yeah. came out this week, as we can all play the same mm. sport now. I was never allowed to play football at school, guys, anyway. Mm. Now, if I was okay. a kid, now I could. That's great news. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to be honest. Um, you know, being born in Lincoln, I feel like that, especially my it wasn't a big school, uh, primary or secondary. I didn't feel that there, obviously there might have been a bit of jealousy, you know, in the secondary school when I was a bit, maybe in year nine, ten, sort of towards the end, but... I never really got that, um, and people weren't really that interested. Which but is interested in you being a pro professional footballer? A professional, or when I was at school? Yeah. No, because you were still a professional. Oh, I you know when you signed for a professional club? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I grew up in Norfolk, and there was a couple of boys at my school who were signed, had signed for Norwich City, mm. and it was always like, oh my god, these guys are you know signed for mm. yeah, our may local team. Maybe, but I, I didn't really get that vibes from school. It wasn't a massive football in school, okay. and maybe that's where the, the self drive came in. Um, I don't know because I didn't I didn't get that praise. Obviously, some of the teachers knew, and especially in secondary school, um, they were amazing with me. They let me go when I had to train half. Like so, I play. So I did like Tuesday and Thursdays in year nine. I started leaving school half days. Then probably people thought, oh, what's Ryan's leaving French? You know, at, at one o'clock or I don't know. But and I, but I'm one of them people. I didn't really care what they thought anyway, um, whether they were praising or. You know, being really jealous, I, I didn't care because I was just so focused on, on becoming a professional at Forest. Well, yeah, you're, you're here now, obviously. And I guess the one question that the fans will, will know about mm -hmm. this, and I guess it's one that you've spoken about as well, the fact that I feel like you've now done full circle with the fans. Mm -hmm. You know, it hasn't always been the best relationship. Mm -hmm. 2022, mm -hmm. you were voted Fans Player of the Year. Mm -hmm. Did that feel like a, another big moment? for you and one that you kind of felt should have always been there um, no I, no I don't I don't think I deserved that um, to be to be there I'm going to be honest I think you know breaking it I think it was always going to be and I've seen I saw it before it even happened to me where you know young players you know they, they do really well a manager comes in they think oh he's doing really well he, even if they're not good the first few games they're brilliant and then suddenly everyone's like oh no he's rubbish because the team Get, don't perform or you know and then suddenly you've gone from being the best player in the world to to rubbish so I think that that definitely happened with me um, obviously got my chance with obviously did all the loans when got my chance with Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane and you know I broke in scored a few goals from midfield and it's like oh my god we've got the next Roy Keane on our hands and unfortunately you know we did I didn't score I didn't continue to keep scoring a goal every other game like everyone expected me to and obviously then criticism comes and I think it is much diff much more difficult to, to deal with when you're a bit younger um, you know you read all the social media you see what everyone's saying but I think that's part of the process and it's made me the person I am today um, Is that maybe why you also don't actively participate in kind of social media mm, as much as some of the other players? Yeah probably um, it's nothing I've I think I've probably just done that naturally, like you say. Mm. I find it difficult to just to just post when we win, yeah. and then not to say, "Oh, sorry about I was rubbish today." Uh, you know, getting beat by Man City six 0 at the Etihad. I, you know, I find it really difficult, like like you say, just just trying to stay on that level. I've learned from some fantastic, experienced pros in that in that in that aspect. Like for example, Michael Dawson, who you know played for England, you know played hundreds of times in the Premier League, doesn't even have Instagram, doesn't have a clue. And he's turned out incredible. So I just think, you know, I'll just, I'll just post when I want. And it's not the end of the world as long as, as long as I'm happy. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously the fans are watching what you do on the pitch. Mm. But there is another side to you and one that is really well documented. And a story that I would love you 
to tell us about mm. is uh, it, Stephen Reed was talking about this the money pot at training mm. and that you're quite good at winning this. Please tell everybody this story. Mm, the, money and pot, okay. the money pot. <laughs> cool. So, because um, it just shows your character, I think, and what not everyone gets to see on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. When Cooper came in, um, obviously he was part of that backroom staff. Unfortunately, he left us to pursue his career elsewhere, which we were also disappointed about. But you now we were really pleased for for him. But so we were like, right, we're not. We need to score goals. You know, we, we'd scored a few goals, but we're like, right, we need to improve our set pieces. So it was. He came up with the idea that every week um, we go through the set pieces. Whoever was attacking the ball to try and score would have to put ten pounds in the pot. And at the start, we didn't score, so the pot. You know, if there's five of us, fifty pound a week, mm-hmm. it started. You know, getting Mounting a lot up. of money. Yeah. <laughs> And obviously I went for a run of just being, just scoring <laughs> from so many set pieces. So I was picking up the pot quite regularly. So, yeah. And giving it out to... Oh, yeah. That when I gave it to the kitchen staff, yeah, yeah. a couple of times, yeah. which they deserve it. Because, you know, people also don't realise that, you know, f- the football club that there's probably staff who, you know, I've been in, you know, 20 odd years, last maybe 18 years and... There's so many staff I've have yet to meet or, you know, I'm saying about these people being here. I bet there's loads of people who've been here longer than me. I'm just not mentioning them or I can't remember. And they're people who, you know, go under the radar and do, you know, countless things for us, go above and beyond for us every single day and they don't get the recognition they deserve. So, you know, just me doing that is, I think it's my duty to do that. You know, I feel like I have to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that money pot kind of shows a little bit about the culture or the mm. culture that was mm. especially on the training pitch are there any similar things that happen at the moment just to give that little bit of competitive edge at training but in a, a nice light-hearted way that also kind of builds the camaraderie and mm. there uh, there actually isn't at the minute but it's such a good thing with that we need to you know we've been doing a lot of um, you know, team meals and, and things like that. And there has been a lot of change in personnel. So it's been diff- difficult to get that consistency with something. Obviously, last season we were sort of set with sort of 13, 14 players who would play every single game. So it was quite easy to do things like that. But it's definitely something we should we should look into. We did have Scarpa on the podcast and he had the Rubik's Cube and said he was going to do a tournament. So possibly that could be what you're doing. Yeah, nice. I've now um, achieved two layers. I can't quite do the top. Yeah. You can achieve it now? I can. You can he, he, it? He, he taught me, yeah. Yeah. He, he's honestly... He's amazing. He's come to the club and he's just been such a breath of fresh air. Um, Scarpa, he just, he's just given us a new outlook. He's always got the Rubik's Cube in his hand, but he's always there for a chat. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can't do it. Can I complete that? Can you complete the top one? Yeah, I can have a little. Oh, you know, I've not done it for ages. Um, Imagine if I like mess it up now. No, we so had we had him now? on, and he was. Um, I bet he did it. Like, did he do it? So, well, actually, and I kind of said it was a faulty. He was like, "You're not going to complete this. Like, the cube's the wrong way around." I was like, "That's why I couldn't do it." Anyway, it wasn't. I just. I'm not going to try now. Okay. So I don't. You can, do, I don't you can really. leave that there. Um, I guess one of the questions as well, Ryan, and you know, obviously you, you haven't been playing a couple of times recently, mm. and I guess everyone wants to kind of mm. just get a little bit of an insight if you're willing to share mm. of, of what the problems were with you. Yeah, I was just I was just feeling um, a little bit lightheaded in games. So, you know, the doctor and the medical staff just basically said you have to you have to, you know, not play for a bit. Um, and now slowly I'm just I'm just building back up my fitness and hopefully um, in the next week or two I'm I'm gonna be fully fit and raring to go. Cause it's something that we all seem quite worried about. Was it something that you were quite concerned mm. with? No, well, yeah, but it's it's one of them things. I just listened to what the medical staff were saying, and luckily they've given me the all clear just to just to crack on and, and continue and try and get to back to the form that, that I had previously, where I feel like I was really growing in, in, into the team. So nothing that's kind of got long no, lasting yeah, effects that we don't. Not. No, we have to all worry about. No, all good, <laughs> all good, all good. Because friends of mine were also saying, if you don't ask anything, just okay. ask that that okay. one question. And I cool. think everyone obviously no, all good is very concerned. Yeah with you and you know wanting to see you back to full fitness yes. and back to playing 90 yeah, minutes it's happening soon great tick tick cleared off well thanks for chatting to us today uh, we're not quite finished we have which you've already cast your eyes on our leaderboard okay to finish with ryan if you please Right, we have our leaderboard here. Yeah. You can see Scarpa is on there. What's he got? Three and a half. Extra time. We did another question, so we got that one. Mm-hmm. I think he got that one right. He really confused me if you watched that episode. Anyway, so 
They're a little bit about you with a slight deviation to other people now. Okay, but okay, anyway. Yeah. Okay, question one. Yeah. When did you go on loan to Shrewsbury Town? What? On the exact the year. day? No, just the year, sorry. Oh, I should specify on. that, shouldn't I? Come on. <laughs> oh, come on. I thought this was an easy one to start with. Um... I genuinely was like, right. 2018. No. 19. No, you would given me two answers. Yeah, because that's the third answer. That doesn't, that doesn't count. It was zero. Okay, we've spoken a lot about social media. <laughs> I can't believe that's so bad. 2017 was the correct answer. Um, we've spoken a lot about social media. This is question two. Yeah. On Twitter, you follow a shocking number of two accounts. Do you know the two accounts that you follow? On Twitter. Twitter. You literally follow two accounts. And I was like, surely he'll know these two accounts that you follow. But just think about who you may follow, because it's quite possible. Like Premier League. That's one. Yeah. And you follow one more account. Oh, I only follow two people. You only people. follow two people on Oh, uh, Nottingham Forest. Yay! Yeah, yeah, okay. Correct. Okay, sorry. I, I was think like, I've got, must have hundreds of followers. No, okay. no, you only follow two. So Premier oh, League sorry. and yeah. Nottingham yes, Forest. Yes, yes. Correct. Okay. Next question. Yeah. In 2022, yeah. you were voted the Fans Player of the Year. Yeah. Who was the Young Player of the Year last year? Brennan Johnson. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was okay. Yeah, that was okay, easy. Okay. okay. Um, in your 150th appearance video, somebody in that video said to you, if we could take a pint of Ryan's blood mm. and give it to the academy players, mm. we'd have a really... Successful team. Who said that? Gary Brazil. Correct. Is that three that you've got right now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And finally, during lockdown, Nottingham Forest hosted a pub quiz online. Who was the pub quiz host in that quiz? <laughs> Joe Warrell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, they were pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So you got one wrong there. Yeah. So you got four. Yeah. And we have a bonus, bonus. question for you. Please play this name this player flew down from the north and landed in the forest if you'd like it are again are they speaking they're we've speaking we've changed yeah. the, the voice slightly okay. do you want that again is it recent just it's recent it's recent yeah take two i flew down from the north and landed in the forest so also think about what you're saying that line sorry i wrote that line i flew down from the north and I landed in the forest. <laughs> Who said that? Who from, from the north? Who's done that recently as well? Of the country? No, uh, the country. No, do you play it one more time? Flew down from the north and landed in the forest. It should be so easy, shouldn't it? Like, think about... So what are they saying? I flew from the no down from the north and landed in the forest. So, who signed recently and came from a northern club? Oh, it's John Joe, shall we, yeah? yeah. I was thinking Colback, and I didn't think John Joe, yeah, okay, cool. There we go, five out of six, have I got a penny? There you go. And it was almost 2016 as well, Shrewsbury, because I, I joined February. You like said 2019, 18, and then 17. 17 yeah. So you didn't even say 16. No, no. I know. So you're definitely wrong. I was miles off it, yeah. <laughs> right, so Ryan Yates got... Five points. I, mean, I can't write this. I'm going to write it in here. Say that. Ryan Yates, five points on the leaderboard. Scarpa second at the moment with three and a half. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining. The official Nottingham Forest podcast on and off the pitch. Quality. If you're watching on YouTube, then remember to subscribe and hit the like button. Not very good at YouTube. Go on, you know how to do it. And also subscribe wherever you listen to your favourite <laughs> podcasts on as well. Thank you very much, Ryan. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>